All right, welcome to a guide on Shadow Tank or the Jedi Counselor Tanking class. So let's start this off by going over our tank stats and gearing. So the set of choice, especially defensively, is going to be robes of effic sorry, efficient termination set. Uh, the reason why this is so good is six piece. When you use spinning kick, you get 10% damage reduction for six seconds. Spinning kick can be used every 19 seconds. So you get a, a real frequent damage reduction. That's real nice to have. Now the other thing is most of the other sets just aren't good anyways. Uh, the other set that you can use that's still fairly useful for all scenarios is going to be Death Knell, which is the offensive base set where you're looking at doing extra damage. It's good one size fits all kind of idea. I used to use that when I first started out, but now I find that I much prefer having the defensive set on. When it comes to amplifiers, what we're going to be looking for is defensively there's a couple choices. Oral resistance is a general one size fits all, reduces the damage taken from attacks that affect an area. Pretty much every boss spills out AoE damage throughout the fight. So this is your nice one size fits all. And then when you're doing specific bosses, you want to look at Tech Agus. So I mostly have Tech Agus on right now. Because when I was doing Master and Blaster, uh, this was, you know, all of the damage was tech. And we're also going to be going to God soon, so a large amount of the damage is going to be tech. So this just helps give that extra defensive against them. Again, not super critical. You can get away with even using the offensive ones if you want, like Armor Penetration. What we want for top left here is always going to be Sun Tech Absorb. So Sun Tech Warding Device and Sun Tech Warding uh, this is just the best you can get. But again, until you can find these pieces, don't stress too hard about it. Any piece will do. Uh, these are just the best you can get. And then in the bottom left, I like to use the flat stats. So not the ones that give you a percent chance, but the ones that just straight up give me stats. Balance out my shield and absorb as I need. In terms of crystals, I like to use the critical crystals just because... The endurance ones only help you if you go into Duxin or a few limited flashpoints, and I don't think the benefit's worth the trade-off. It's better to just be set up to do really well in as many situations as possible. Alright, so that's your crystals, that's your set bonus, that's your left side other than the tactical, which I've skipped on purpose for now. And then let's look at what we actually want to put in. So for level 70 content, uh, generally, you're going to want high defense rating warding mods. So ideally, something like a superior warding mod R13 is going to give me, oops, not the R13, the R18, which is 364 defense rating. That's the highest defense rating that I can get uh, off of pretty much, I think it is the highest, I can't remember. But yeah, high defense rating for level 70 because your endurance doesn't matter. You're going to be set to a fixed value anyways. Uh, and mastery, again, is set to a cap or fixed value. I should say it's a cap. So you're not worried about those for level 70. When you go into Duxin, though, I've put some of mine as slightly lower defense so that I get a little more endurance. And then I'm going to actually take in my inventory these lethal 80 Bs. And I'm going to swap them out. So if I wanted to do level 75 content... I would just come in here and I would rip out this one and I would just start putting in a bunch of lethal mods and I would raise my power value over here and these also have very high endurance so again that's why we're choosing the ADBs for our level 75 content is you want to have some more power to help you generate threat and hold threat better because everyone else will be dealing a crap ton of damage and also they're very high on endurance. As far as your enhancements go because we're using the Absorb in the top left, typically, you'll find that a lot of your enhancements end up being the Shielding. For level 70, you're going to want to go with Immunity. You're going to want to get as high as Shield rating as possible. And for level 75, it's really up to you what you want to use. Uh, you don't have to use Immunity. You can get away with using pretty much anything of your choice. Uh, a lot of people like to use the ones that are higher endurance rather than the higher shield rating. Personally though, I just stick with this. Keep it simple, it works for me. I don't think it's gonna make or break the game a huge amount. I've done some math around this and 
we're talking about like 1% total difference, maybe 1.5% total difference in terms of the amount of damage you can take before dying. Because you have to remember, when you trade off shield and absorb to get endurance, uh, you're not defending quite as much. But when you get endurance, you've got all these built-in defensives that already help uh, with, with uh, mitigating damage. And you have a larger health pool, so therefore endurance actually does come out slightly ahead on paper. And then if we're looking at our absorb ones, you're going to be wanting to do the sturdiness ones. The main thing that I look for is when you're doing the level 75 ones, you can cap out at 431 shield or absorb ratings. So if I'm over 431, I know these are good level 70 enhancements to be putting on. Now let's go over our tacticals since there are so many of them. So the main tactical you're going to be using for a lot of fights is two cloaks. You get two charges of force cloaks, so your stealth out of combat. As we talk later in the utility section, there's uh, you actually apply a defensive on force cloak, which is very useful. You also get to mitigate a lot of boss mechanics with force cloak. So a lot of fights you will be using force cloaks. It's it's a fairly good one size fits all. But we do have some other options. So shroud of a shadow. Uh, this one, using Resilience with Kinetic Ward is active, consumes it, and extends the duration of Resilience by a quarter second for each stack. So if I activate my Kinetic Ward, I gain 15 stacks down here. And if I was to have this Tactical on and use Resilience, I would actually get 4 seconds more, almost 3.75 seconds more, of my Resilience. That's huge! It's a huge amount. So fights where you don't need a different Tactical, uh, one example was I was solo tanking Colossal Monolith, and therefore I chose to use Shroud of a Shadow because you don't actually need two cloaks to stealth out that frequently. You can take three stacks, stealth out when he's about to apply the fourth one, and then you have a lot of resilience to mitigate that bite wound damage when he's doing his breaking the rift mechanic. So that's an example of where I used it. Go to sleep, go to sleep. This is just kind of a quality of life thing. Sleep enemies allows you to sneak past them. There is a nice little trick where you can equip it, sleep two enemies, take it off, sleep a third enemy. Time consuming. I just put it on sometimes for flashpoints and generally just easy content. Ancient Tomb of Wrath. Uh, this is basically damage reduction for when you're doing a lot of AoE. So when there's a lot of adds. You get an additional 2% absorption for every enemy hit by your slow time and it lasts 5 seconds. Well, we can do our slow time roughly every 10 seconds. So 5 seconds on, 5 seconds off. And if you're hitting the maximum 8 enemies, you're going to be getting 16% additional shield absorb. It's just there. I never really use it, but it's there just in case. I'm doing some content where we're just constantly killing large amounts of enemies like uh, heroics or flashpoints or something. Order the Continuum, I have this one here. I've never actually used it. I don't think I ever will. But, you know, some people like to say, I don't know, maybe I just have it because, I have no idea. Friend of the Forest, this one I actually have used a few times. Your guard will also apply um, resilience to that player whenever you activate resilience. So this can be extremely useful, being able to apply resilience to another player to help with certain mechanics. So Apex uh, Vanguard, no. Apex, is it the Apex Vanguard? I don't know, final boss on Duxon. If you have somebody who can't cleanse himself in the group, you guard them, you can cleanse them now when you use your resilience. Uh, Dread Palace, when you're doing the council, you can cleanse death marks. Nephra, at the beginning of Dread Fortress, you can cleanse somebody. So there's just lots of little times where this is more useful to your group to be able to apply resilience you know, Tear From Beyond Operation, if you want to do the Dread Guards, I think it's the Doom Mechanic or Lightning Field, something like that. You can, you know, you can help mitigate a lot of damage to players who don't necessarily have the right defensives to survive that easily. So that that's also a very useful one on specific fights that I would highly suggest having ready in your arsenal. Uh, the Shroud of a Shadow is a lot more niche, and Go to Sleep, Go to Sleep is really nice when you're outside of operations, but inside operations, it's kind of meh. Some people love it, but it's not critical. Alright, let's move on now to figuring out how many points you want in everything. So, it's not a big deal. If you're kind of following the gear I suggested, you're going to end up with the right stuff anyways. 
Uh, but if we go to our defense tab here, just for completeness sake, uh, you can see my absorb right now is about 2,700 points. My shield is about 4,700. But more valuable is looking at the actual percentage here. So shield chance should any, be anywhere between about 49 to 54%, depending on how complete your gear is. Uh, I would always suggest running higher than 50%. Some people play all the way up to 54%. I'm not a big fan of 54% just because of how much shield absorption you lose. But, you know, teach their own. So I like 51% shield chance for a very specific reason. That's because I activate Kinetic Ward and now I have 69% shield chance. So, you know, just, yeah, 69. Makes me chuckle. And shield absorption is just going to be whatever's left. But you should always end up with a minimum 47% shield absorption. Typically, you know, you're going to be closer to that 49%, uh, depending on where exactly you let your stats fall. And then we want to look at force to figure out things like our alacrity and our accuracy. Now you'll notice I have zero points in accuracy. Tanks don't need it, 11% bonus. They are gonna hit no matter what. So they have that 110% that you need to guarantee hitting against bosses. And you're gonna see that I've actually got 82 points in critical uh, from my crystals, just because I don't find the endurance ones are worth putting in as don't run 75 that much and alacrity wise i always like to run just one extra in augment or alacrity just because the way server lag issues happen sometimes your attacks don't quite hit at 1.5 gcds if you leave it at zero so i like to put a little extra to account for some of those server lag issues right now i do have the five percent buff from my guild perk but as soon as i go into a master mode or nightmare content that's going to get removed and I no longer have that buffer to make sure that my alacrity is behaving well with the server lag. All right, let's talk about utilities. Everybody's favorite question to always ask about. So as you can see, kinetic combat, I'm a tank class. Let's go through and skillful tier. So celerity, uh, the main reason why I take this one is for speed has a shorter cooldown. Your interrupts also faster, but just having four speed up more often is nice. That's really the reason why I take it. Uh, this one, basically, I consider this a PvP related one. Against bosses, it's not useful at all. Uh, intangible spirit, sometimes I do take this one. So as a tank, reduce all damage taken while stunned by 30%. So if you know that you're going to get stunned and take damage while stunned, this is a great one to take. Lambast, increase the damage done by whirling blow by 25%. Your spammable AoE now does more damage. This is optional, but it is a really good one to have, especially for trash or boss fights where you know you'll try and keep threat on more than one target at a time. Force Wake, I consider this a PvP related one. I don't really find it's useful against bosses at all. Same with Snaring Strikes. Uh, nerve Racking, this one, target controlled by a spinning kick or force stun takes 5% more damage from all sources. This would be great, except that as far as I understand, if a target is immune to stuns, they're not being controlled by your spinning kick, and therefore they don't take more damage. And bosses are always immune, more or less. So I don't think this one's actually useful for bosses, but you know, potentially this one you could take as well. Uh, it's definitely more tuned towards PvP. Shadow Shelter, I like this one a lot. I generally have this one up. Uh, when you AoE taunt, you basically defend all of your nearby allies and slightly heal them so i just think that one's great in general i pretty much always have it on although you could switch it out for intangible spirit if you wanted or switch out lambast for intangible spirit on those few fights where you want that damage reduction stunned. masterful fade we're going to want to take fade period reduce the cooldown of force cloak and extend its duration it's mostly for the reduction that we need to take this this direction, I feel like this is just PvP, but also sometimes I'll take it for flashpoints, running heroics, stuff like that. Get the extra movement speed is really nice, and it's easier to sneak past enemies that are able to see you while you're stealthed. Let's just droids. Uh, force harmonics, I like this one just because force potency gains an additional charge when activated, and that just means more damage, and everything else in this tree kind of sucks. <laughs> so kinetic acceleration, this one is not useful for operations. We're only ever going to be using act, uh, Project. So you get a speed boost when you use Project. 
more PvP focused, you could potentially take this for lower level content where you just want to run faster. Uh, motion control, this one, the thing that might be useful to us a little bit is Force Cloak, increase your movement speed by 50%, and eh, we're not really going to be needing this at all. Again, this is one of those ones maybe on some low level content you want to run fast, you'd take it, not useful for operations. So sturdiness, sometimes I have taken this one. I find that it's very, very hard to use effectively, but you can definitely take it and try and use it. Activating deflection grants six sections of immunity to stun, sleep, lift, and incapacitating effects. Um, so it does not prevent knockbacks. That's the important thing to note. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's just kind of, I just find it so hard to time. It's so hard to be useful, but, as an advanced player, you might be able to learn to use it quite effectively. Egress. Four speed grants egress, move, removing all movement impairing effects and grant immunity to them for the duration. So this is just great in general. Uh, if you have nothing better to take, just take this. And it's very rare that you have anything better to take, so just take it. And even then, you could get rid of force harmonics before you get rid of egress. Egress is just useful in way more sense. Containment. Uh, again, bosses, you can't really use force lift on them, so... Not very useful. You might want to take it for some weaker, lower level content, but PvP is the main focus of this one. Heroic tier. Now we start getting some actual choices, I guess you could say. <laughs> and there's some very mandatory ones. So Cloak of Resilience. Activating Force Cloak grants two seconds of resilience. That is a must take. This is just absolutely amazing. Adding a defensive on top of your Force Cloak allows you to use it for a lot more boss mechanics than just ones that get interrupted when you stealth out. Battery Veil, uh, again, this one seems to be basically just PvP related, you know, some extra movement speed. Um, Mind Maze, we're not going to be using that on certain boss enemies, or the majority, so not very useful. Mind Over Matter, increase the duration of resilience by 2 seconds and 4 speed. Anyways, either way, increase duration of resilience by 2 seconds, mandatory must take. Uh, Stalker Swiftness, this is one that I do like to take sometimes. It allows you to use your sub-30 attack, your spinning strike, or within 10 seconds of using Stalker Swiftness, and it's also really good that if you kill that enemy within 10 seconds, it resets your swift Shadow Stride. So this is really useful for lower level content, speed running stuff, uh, just more damage in general. You can bring it to ops as well. And really this is just one of those ones where you have to choose between what your third choice is, Sometimes I choose this one, as you can see, um, oh, I'll get into that later maybe, but yeah, so sometimes it's very useful for just that extra damage. This one, I would say this is basically just a PvP related one. Uh, when entering stealth with Force Cloak, you generate a stack of restorative shade and heal 4% of your maximum health every 2 seconds for 10 seconds. They last for 6 seconds, the stacks, and when stealth is broken, each stack heals you for 4% of your health. So this is really good as a self-heal, as a defensive. Uh, this is kind of one of your, out of the last choice, you can sometimes want to take this one to get the self-heal. One with the shadows. You could potentially take this, you know, if you're immobilized, you can still use it and it urges movement impairing effects and activating force speed or kinetic combat will increase your force regeneration rate by 10 the duration of force speed. This is really good if you're an off tank. As an off tank, it's hard to actually keep up enough force to attack. You're constantly going to be running out. So I would highly suggest taking this one as an off tank as your last choice. Or, you know, potentially you don't. I, I think it's probably just as your last choice. That's probably the best choice. I wouldn't really suggest getting rid of the, either of the other two. And then we have Avenging Grip. So Deflection now also reflects damage to enemies. As a tank, uh, Deflection will reflect 100% of all direct single target tech and force damage back at the attacker. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't necessarily do kinetic ranged attacks, which is a bit of a bummer. And no reflect reflects melee attacks. So that's pretty standard. But you still take the damage, you do not absorb it like a Guardian does. But still, you know, this is one, just increase your damage a little bit, depending on the type of enemies that are hitting you. Of course, useless against melee enemies, useless against kinetic ranged, but good against tech and force.
All right. So this is kind of what I would suggest as your general layout for utilities. The only one I would say is Avenging Grip. You can either take Stalker Swiftness to use your Spinning Strike and Shadow Stride more effectively. Restorative Shade if you just want more self-heal. And then one with the Shadows if you're off tanking is, I would say, it's a great one to bring. All right, so I've set myself up at uh, some target training dummies so that we can go over our opener and our threat rotation. So... Oh, I've skipped a section, user interface and layout. So now we're gonna go over user interface and layout. So that is, how do I set up my user interface? Why are, why are my buttons laid out the way they are? So here you can see top left bar, I've got just a smattering of different kind of utilities type stuff and some things that are actually used in combat as well. You don't have to have them up here, this is what I've chosen to do. The ones that get used in combat are gonna be your stun break, your med pack, your adrenal, and you could kind of say your stim, although usually your stim's on outside of combat. And then I've also got my class buffs as well as my self heal set up on this bar. And then other useful things like leap pass, a repair droid, my quick travel, and then my defensives that I can use with companion out unity and heroic moment. So this is just kind of a general purpose useful stuff that I click somewhat often. And then now we come down a bit and we see I've got my actual icon, my health bars and everything right here. I've got my buffs right above. My debuffs will show up more centered over to the right. And then below that, I've got a bar that has basically my main defensive and taunts and guard and stuff like that. So this is quick bar one, and you'll notice that I have a blank space right here. So quick bar one ability one, by default, when you right click on an enemy or something, it will activate that ability. So to prevent some issues with the game, I have actually made sure there's nothing in here so that when I right click to move my mouse, I'm not accidentally activating the ability here. That's why we have this weird blank spot. And then I had some extra room, so I put some tactical markers. Originally I had a tactical marker in that spot and I would just find that suddenly I was holding a tactical marker on my mouse and I couldn't click things, couldn't do abilities. Yeah, bad news. So oh, defensives, we've got Force Cloak, Stealth Out of Combat, Apply Resilience, extremely good, extremely useful. Battle Readiness, this is a defensive, you want to use it as much, you get a significant amount of damage reduction and it does self-heal. Resilience, amazing defensive. Uh, deflection, again, another defensive. And then I've got Stealth, Guard, uh, Mass Mind Control, AoE Taunt, and Single Target Taunt. The other thing to notice, I've got Revive here. When you Stealth out of combat to revive somebody, you have to have it on your bar. So you'll Stealth out, you'll select them, and then you'll click Revive on your bar. Otherwise, if you right-click them to revive them, you will fail. To the right here, I've got my main chunk of abilities that I use. This is to make things as compact as possible. Uh, I don't always use hotkeys but I like having things visually in a small space so that I can flick my eyes back and forth without going across the whole screen. And for when I am clicking with my mouse instead of using hotkeys, it makes everything nice and tight. Below that is just general combat utilities and abilities that I don't use as frequently, but are still quite important. So you can see like my mind maze, my sleep, my lift that breaks on damage, my push, my force pull, a spinning kick, which I use as a defensive. I've chosen to put it down here, it's just I find that's a nice place to have it compared to over with my defensives. And then off to my right here, I've got my opener bar. This is where I just put my opener. I lay it out without the taunts in it, pretty simple. It's there just so that I can mindlessly mash those buttons in an order when I'm feeling really lazy or I don't want to memorize something. My main target is going to be right underneath my feet over here. Uh, just to the top right of most of the abilities that I'm going to be using the majority of the fight. Target to target is up and to the right again, so that it's very easy to see as a tank. I want to see, is he looking at me or not? I don't want the boss looking at somebody else when he's supposed to be looking at me. Then I can taunt if I see that this changes. That's why I like it up there. Focus target, we're going to put our focus target is down there. I like keeping everything nice and compact. compact and as you can see, I've centered... Uh, the actual boss itself underneath my feet, target of target is just offset, and then all the abilities I'm using are offset a bit. So how does this actually look in my interface editor? Well, so here we go. One of the main things is system messages. Make sure you move this. This is the red text, it's very important. I put it right in the middle of my screen. I make it really big. Some people put it even lower down. 
up to you. But main thing is system messages scale 1.25. That's super important. As you can see, my debuffs I set are off to the right of my actual player frame. So they sit there in the middle and I've made them larger as well, scaled them up. And my cast bar is right below there, right near my abilities. The boss's cast bar, there's two reasons why I've moved it up higher. The first reason is I want it closer to my character so that it's easier to see if I'm looking at my feet. And then the other reason is all the buffs and debuffs from the boss grow quite large and it gets really cluttered so I moved it out of the way. So there's really not too much else to show here. I've got operation frames uh, and then we want to look at, you can save them. So really now I just have a DPS set up and a guardian tank is basically what I use for everything. Originally I had a few unique things for uh, a diff couple of different classes, but now I've started standardizing stuff now that I have so many characters. All right. That is my user interface and my layout. I haven't gone over hotkeys too much. Uh, I will just quickly mention that I've got additional quick bar six here, specifically just for hotkeying things that I use frequently and want to have on some of my most convenient hotkey. So let's talk about our opener now. So we've got a couple options depending on what utility we took. If we took this Docker Swiftness, we're going to have a slightly different opener than if we don't take it. So Right now, it's my bar is set up for Stalker Swiftness being taken. So I do a Force Pull. It's my highest threat gen. I can do it at range. And then I'm going to Shadow Stride in. Now, you don't want to Shadow Stride on every boss. Some bosses will kill you. If that's the case, you're going to use Force Speed instead to get in real quickly. So you can, because you're going to pull from range. And then now you've got a whole bunch of threat built with Force Pull. It buys you a little bit of lead time. Shadow Stride with the utility will make it so you can use Spinning Strike later on in your opener. We're going to go into project. The reason why we do project first here is because we need a certain number of GCDs for project to come off cooldown to use it again right before cascading debris. So it's very important that we use project first and not slow time just for the opener. So we're going to do project. We're going to do slow time. Uh, slow time is really good threat generation is why we're using it. At this point, you should have been hit by the boss and your force breach should be procced. It should be glowing. So you're gonna hit your force breach. And then with the utility, we would use spinning strike because it would be the highest damaging ability. And now we're gonna use force potency. We'll get two charges of it. If you're using anything other than the death knell set. And we're gonna use the first one on project, which may or may not be accelerated at that point. It's not critical. And then once we do this, we're now gonna proc our cascading debris and we're going to use a glowing cascading debris. Now you'll notice I have a little bit of a gap in here. Um, usually I AoE taunt right there. Not all fights you need to, but there's just a little bit of a thing with the timing that's off, just a tiny bit with the cooldown. And then we're going to go straight into slow time because that's the next highest threat that we have available to us. And then we're going to use shadow strike, which will be glowing. Uh, and then after that, you just go into the regular priority system of shadow. So our opener, a few things to note is whenever possible you want to start from stealth because this will grant you stacks of shadow protection which is the same stacks that you get from using cascading debris when it's glowing. So there we go, we start combat from stealth. If you are not going to be taking the utility for spinning strike, you're going to be using a shadow strike instead and what you'll actually want to do is you want to use a whirling blow. Now it's propped. Now it's glowing. You can see that lasts quite a while, almost 15 seconds. We have lots of time to do that. Oh, it didn't reset it. Oh, interesting. It does not refresh it. I didn't know that. So say the ready check, check just passes, I'd do that. And then you wouldn't be stealth though. And then you would the ready check pass, you do your whirling blow, you're gonna stealth. And now we're going to go straight into our openness. We're going to pull. In this case, I'm going to stride to it, project, low time. Now this isn't going to be glowing because I didn't have anything attacking me. And then you saw I used my glowing shadow strike. And then I went into project, cascading debris, and then slow time. And then shadow strike, potentially again. But at this point, you know, you're going to go into your normal rotation. So. Uh, now we've got a piece our companion gotcha, and 
You have to get in the dummy out of combat. It's so annoying. Forgot about that. So yeah, that's your opener. That's that's fairly high threat opener. Where you're going to place your taunts depends on how important it is to make sure the boss doesn't look at anybody else. So you've got a couple places you can place your taunts. Uh, so you get six seconds of taunt. So you want to make sure that you're not interfering with that. So generally what happens is your first three GCDs, you don't have to worry about anybody ripping threat off of you and you don't need a taunt. So generally, you know, we, we consider force pull to be a zero GCD. Project would be one, slow time is two, force breach is three. So as soon as you activate force breach, uh, you can do your single target taunt if you really need to make sure you're keeping threat. And then you're gonna have one GCD for spinning strike, two GC GCDs for project, and then three, four for cascading debris because it lasts two GCDs. So at 1.5 seconds for each GCD, that brings us up to six seconds. So now you're not now you're gonna have your AOE taunt immediately afterwards, so that you have over your two taunts kind of sit back to back without overlapping too much. Now you can always delay that first taunt a little bit. You don't have to do it immediately after force breach. You could do it, you know, just before you do your spinning strike or shadow strike, depending on which one you have there. And then that way there'd be like half a second to a second of overlap after cascading debris to start your AOE taunt. So sometimes you want to put that little bit of delay in your first taunt so that there's 100% overlap with your, not 100%, so that there is actual overlap with your second taunt. But a lot of times you're fine, just, you know, the timing will work out that you can do your taunt right after you hit force breach and right after cascading debris and nobody will have an issue ripping. Now, fights where you don't have to worry about people ripping off of you as much, and it's not as important, you can delay those taunts. You can move them around, you can change them, you can wait until target of target shows that somebody else has ripped threat off you and then taunt immediately so that you gain a bonus on top of theirs. So this is where it's important to know how taunts work with threat generation. So the general idea is whoever has the highest threat is going to have the boss look at them. Uh, and if you pull first, you're going to start with the highest threat. So how does another player get the boss off of you? Well, they don't just need one point of threat higher than you. They need a certain amount depending on how far they are from the center of the boss. So this boss is a fairly small model. He is, you know, about half a meter to a meter. So if we look and we stand at as close as I can to one meter, this means that the center of my feet is one meter from the outside of this ring here. I'm not one meter. You can see this distance is 0.6 maybe, 0.7 meters. So any player who is going to be standing four meters from the center of the boss. So in this case, it's I'm at about 3.3 meters, you know, 3.5. I'm going to be considered four meters from the center of the boss. I'm now considered ranged. But notice my melee attacks can still hit him because I'm under four meters from the edge of his circle, which is how I hit him. So I'm considered ranged and it's really good to stand at your max melee range for this little trick is when I taunt, I'm going to build an additional 30% threat if I'm ranged from the highest on the threat table. So if I'm the highest on the threat table or somebody else is, when I taunt, I get an extra 30% of the total threat that player has on the boss who's ever got the highest threat. So that's a nice little trick. And if I'm standing closer, so say I was at 2.6 meters, I would only gain a 10% bonus of threat. So how players rip threat off you is also the same idea. If they're within melee range, so if they're close to the center of the boss, within four meters, as soon as they have 10% more total threat than you, as long as a taunt or some other effect isn't forcing the boss to look at somebody, they will suddenly have the highest threat and the boss will swap threat. Um, so technically at 105% of your threat, they have more than you, but the boss won't swap ever without a special mechanic. So there we go. They're going to rip off of you with 10% more threat than you if they're within melee range. The smaller the boss, the higher the chances they'll be in melee range. The bigger the body of the boss, the bigger the circle, the less chance they'll actually be in melee range uh, just because of the way that difference works between the edge of the circle versus the middle of the boss. So ranged have a much harder time ripping off of you because they need to have 30% higher threat than you. So that's why a lot of times people will guard the melee unit, uh, the melee in your group is especially on the bosses with small bodies. That can be quite important. So again, 
just making sure that you know that you're always having a higher threat than other people. And when you taunt, don't don't go crazy trying to make sure you're, so you're taunting outside of that four meter thing to get 30% bonus, but it is really nice when you can. That's definitely something to consider. All right. So now that we've talked about the opener, how threat generation works a little bit, uh, let's talk about our actual rotation or the priority system. So shadow, it's a pretty basic system here. Uh, if you're just doing single target, it's going to be slow time, project, and then we're going to do a filler until project becomes available again, and then we're going to do a cascading debris, and that's your whole rotation. Now you're just going to restart from slow time. So basically, slow time, project, and then we're going to do a filler, and if it takes project off cooldown, and then as soon as cascading debris is blowing, we use it. And at that point, slow time will always be off cooldown. We can always just restart. So the amount of tries it takes to get project off cooldown can vary. Uh, project, potentially, you might have to use three fillers if project doesn't come off cooldown by using one of your fillers. So the priority for our fillers are uh, spinning strike. It's the highest damaging one, but you know either you have to have the utility of shadow stride or have them sub 30 to use it. That's our highest priority filler. Uh, double Strike is technically not the next highest in terms of damage, but I really do like Double Strike because um, it doesn't use as much energy, and it hits the target twice, giving you two chances to take Project off cooldown. But Shadow Strike does a lot more damage, and one of the nice things with Shadow Strike is if Shadow Strike is glowing, it only takes 20 instead of 40 force. So technically a glowing Shadow Strike is better than Double Strike, because it deals more damage for the same amount of energy. The downside is it has less chances to bring project off cooldown. So quite often I will use my uh, double strike first, but then if I notice that projects like two seconds left on the cooldown, there's no point getting it to come off cooldown early, so I'll just use a shadow strike if it's glowing instead. But my first go-to is usually double strike, just because I have a higher chance of bringing project off cooldown. So, you know, the general idea being that, you know, this will drain your force way too fast if you're using it while it's not glowing. And you can change what order you want these in, but remember, Shadow Strike is only higher priority than Double Strike if it's glowing, otherwise it's a very low priority. And of course, you can have Saber Strike when you're completely out and you just need to spam something and regen. I really don't suggest using it, though. <laughs> the other ability that's quite important in single target to think about is Force Breach. Force Breach applies the Unsteady debuff. 45 seconds, melee and ranged accuracy is decreased. If you have a Guardian in the group, they also apply an Unsteady debuff, so just watch for that so you're not overlapping. You don't have to use this ability very often on single targets. Again, 45 seconds, don't have to use it very often. And then if you're using the Efficient Termination set for Spinning Kick giving you 10% DR, you either want to use Spinning Kick more or less on cooldown as a filler, or save it for specific spots in the fight where you know you want that extra 10% DR. So, spinning kick, only if you're using the efficient termination set does it get added into your rotation. Now let's talk about AoE. So AoE is pretty simple and it's amazing compared to a Guardian tank. You have way more options, you have more flexibility. Uh, slow time is going to be your number one priority every time. Slow time is your best AoE. And then Force Breach, especially if it's glowing. If it's not glowing, it's a much lower priority. Force Breach is your second priority. And then Cleaving Cut is an interesting one. So Cleaving Cut, as you can see right now, approximately 6,000 damage is what we can say it's doing on average. Uh, whereas if we look at Whirling Blow, we're only dealing about 5,000 damage on average. So you can see Cleaving Cut has that nice damage advantage. The downside, though, is that Cleaving Cut is a conal. In front of you. So if I was to turn away from this dummy and I use my cleaving cut, I don't hit it. Whereas if I use my whirling blow, I do hit it. So cleaving cut is very much about positioning. You, If you do not have the utility that gives you an extra 25% damage on whirling blow, cleaving cut becomes even better. But the general idea is that you want to hit all the enemies with cleaving cut or, or it's not worth using. If you're only missing one enemy with cleaving cut and you're hitting uh, let's say you're hitting four enemies and you're missing one. At that point, four out of five, 
I would suggest using cleaving cut over a whirling blow. It's, you know, especially without the utility, you would definitely want to use it. Uh, the nice thing too is there's no mention of minimum or maximum number of targets. So I would assume this means I can hit more than eight targets at once with my cleaving cut, but I haven't actually tested it. Whereas Whirling Blow, like all your other AoE, is limited to eight enemies. So just again, quick summary. We're going to do slow time. We're going to go into Force Breach, assuming it's glowing. And then if it's not worth using our cleaving cut, we literally just spam Whirling Blow until our Force Slow, is, our slow time is ready to use again. Now, if you really need that extra defensive capability, you could look at using a project and a cascading debris, but you're going to lose so much AoE threat gen that people are going to start ripping off of you. So if you know everybody's shooting AoE and killing everything in the group at once, it's not worth using project and cascading debris because then you'll lose threat by not having enough AoE damage out on everything. So there we go. That is your single target and your multi-target. Now let's just go over my abilities again that I've got on my bar just to give you a quick rundown. Whirling Blow, AoE, Shadow Stride, Gap Closer, Slow Time, AoE, and your primary single target rotation. Project, single target. Cascading Debris, single target. Spinning Strike, Filler, single target. Double Strike, Filler, for single target. Shadow Stride, Filler, for single target. Force Potency, uh, this one can be used as a defensive. It gives you an additional 30% absorb chance or absorb percentage. Uh, I generally use it as an offensive ability. Uh, it makes all of your force attacks do more. One thing that's interesting to know about these stacks is when you use uh, project, you immediately consume a stack. Cascading debris, it's not until you apply all four ticks that it consumes a stack. So just interesting to know. And double strike, not a force attack, won't consume it. Uh, slow time would. So that's just a little thing to note there. Force Breach applies the Unsteady debuff. When it's glowing, it does enough damage to be justified as an AoE attack. And then Cleaving Cut, again, a very specific positional based AoE attack. And then I've just got my Hard Stun. On my bottom kind of utility bar, Force Speed, which is also Hot Keyed because it's so critical. Kinetic Ward, Hot Keyed because it's so critical. This is a defensive that you want to have up 100% of the time. You always want to see this buff for it up. You have two options. You can either wait until... Oh, actually, we'll go over defensives later, so I'll skip that. Spinning Kick. Uh, Saber Strike in case you're out of force and have nothing else to do. Force Pull. Great threat gen. You know, it's something that you want to have on your bar. Also, just moving enemies. Good push. Uh, interrupt, which I also have hot keyed. Uh, stun that breaks on damage. And then the go to sleep um, ability. And then... Yeah, that's pretty much it. So there you go. Let's move on to the next section. All right, so let's give you an example of actually while we're shooting an enemy, killing an enemy, whatever you want to call it, of using our opener and our general rotation. Be pretty basic. World boss on Corellia, Lucky. He's a pretty simple, straightforward guy that I can just punch for a long time without him dying. We're gonna do our pull. We're gonna come in. This case, we're gonna use. Our uh, Shadow Stride. Oops, I used my abilities in the wrong order. That's not the end of the world. He does do that after Ground Stomp, though. He has that really annoying kind of stun. There, I just used a Taunt. I don't really need to use Taunts much in here at all. But notice now I'm just trying to interrupt that. Now I'm just going to try and get um, my trade into my single target rotation. So, as you can see, I'm already having energy management issues. That is life of the shadow tank for you. I'm just going to use, um, there we go, gain a little bit of attack. Unsteady debuff, just reapplied it because it was getting close to the end. I think I screwed up the rotation there. That is not the end of the world. So we're going to do a filler. Another filler, interrupt that. No, I can't. And I had a little bit of a pause there. Um, just to get my, try and get my energy back up. He's just not hitting me enough is the real issue. I'm gonna taunt him again. Reapply the unsteady debuff. Alright, and then whenever I want to get into the rotation again, when I've kind of screwed it up, personally, what I like to do is I like to kind of just use a random filler somewhere until slow time comes off. Now, it's not optimal. I'll tell you that right away. But it is something that I like to do as it uh, gets me a little bit 
More in sync, a little bit easier to worry about. I've really been doing actually a pretty shitty job in general of using my fillers. Holy. I'm gonna get stunned here for a second. Use my self heal filler. But one of the real nice things about being a tank is you always have taunts to build extra threat, unless, of course, you need them for bosses that specifically screw you over on that category and try and uh, find ways to get rid of and drop it. Now, notice slow time came off cooldown, but I'm just going to finish that simple rotation of eject into blowing cascading debris just to keep things really consistent and make sure that it's not going to get screwed up. One of the nice things too is that if you're, oops, I did that out of order. It should have been project before the um, main kick. You notice this time I had to use three abilities before my project came off cooldown. Sometimes that's just luck of how it goes. And so that's when you kind of use the full rotation without anything else. Now, as I was saying about with a tank, it typically doesn't matter if you're actively able to hit the enemy every single time possible. So we have these taunts. Taunts build us extra threat and they always build us extra threat based off of uh, making us the highest on the th or giving us that bonus percent threat compared to other players. So it's really relaxing, really easy in the sense that if you're good with your taunts, you don't have to be like a DPS who's always hitting abilities all the time and giving it out their best. So that's, that's an important thing to note. Is that it's just not that important that you get everything always done. See, now I messed up because Cascading Brew was already glowing. Now it's kind of in a weird spot, but that's alright. I can just use a filler, wait for slow time to come off cooldown, and then it'll keep me from having to do weird things with resync up my rotation or getting out of. So again, just that, and then I go straight into filler. That one can't bring the project off cooldown. One thing that's a little awkward about Double Strike is because it's two hits at two different times during the GCD, you can be bringing yourself off cooldown right before you go to click your next ability. Don't worry about it. Like If you click the next ability because you didn't know Project was going to come off cooldown, so be it. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, you having a DPS difference of 300 DPS because you do this rotation perfectly versus not perfectly, that should not be the cause of your team wiping or what they need to be better at. You know, you've got your taunts to make sure you keep enough threat. That's your big goal, is your most important thing, is you have to be keeping threat. And if you're doing that right, losing a few hundred DPS is, you know, that's up to your DPS on your team. If they're not able to meet those damage checks, it's not on you as a tank to be 100% perfect top damage parts. That's not to say that your DPS doesn't count, because your DPS is still very important, and it does add up. Just that you don't have to be perfect. So as you can see, pretty simple. I generally refresh Kinetic Ward before it's close to expiring, but more advanced players will always wait until it's close to expiring, rather than doing it when there's just a little bit of time left. So you can see right here I'm waiting, watching it, and I would apply it now. So there we go, refresh to close to the end as possible. And, but otherwise, you know, you can just spam it. You'll lose a little bit of shield absorption percent bonus. But, you know, it's not a big bonus. So, not going to make or break things. And then, generally, spinning kick, I like to use that as a filler on cooldown. Because this boss has no specific uh, windows where that 10% DR is going to be uh, absolutely critical to have saved on to. Now we can just see how stealthy out of combat. Uh, in this scenario, because I'm not in a group fighting him, we just completely end combat. Now, there'll be other examples that I will show you where your stealthing out will actually prevent uh, certain abilities from going. The thing to remember when you stealth out of combat, there's a few things you have to remember. Your guard will fall off when you stealth out of combat, so you'll have to reapply your guard, which I didn't have one to begin with, but just so you know. You will also have your threat reset to zero, or and then when you re-enter combat, your threat will be one. Not a big deal. Generally, you can just say zero. That's really important to know that you now have the lowest threat on everything, and you're going to need to taunt immediately to get threat back on you when you need something to look at you. Uh, so you got to be very careful that when using the stealth out of combat, that if you need a taunt right away, you have it available. In some scenarios, you don't need the taunt right away. 
Uh, some other examples might be that you want to use your force cloak to give yourself resilience. And in that scenario, you'll need to make sure that you're stealthing out and taunting immediately. So as you can see here, resilience, I get the four seconds. That's, that's important to note with that. So when you take the utility that adds two seconds on resilience and the one that activating force cloak grants resilience, you get the full bonus. You get all four seconds of it. So. Well, that's just an important little note. Now there are some other perks that don't, I believe, um, I believe when you're using this tactical that you won't get it. So we can equip this tactical, tactical and quickly test it out. I'm just curious. I'm going to activate that, activate this. Oh, I'm already stealth. I gotta get out of stealth first. So kinetic ward, full stacks. Look at this. Yeah, see only four seconds. So the tactical does not impact <clears throat> Shroud of a Shadow does not impact the resiliency game from Force Cloak, but the utility that extends it by two seconds does. Now the other thing that you might want to test out it, uh, to make sure is Friend of the Force. So when you have somebody who's guarded, what are they going to get for, for the resilience bonus? So we'll wait a few seconds for resilience to come off cooldown. This one's straightforward. They're going to get it. Now the question is, do they get the two seconds or do they get the four seconds? Uh, yeah. Wrong button. <laughs> I unguarded them instead of coming out of stealth. Alright, through the magic of time skipping, we'll apply resilience again here, and as you can see, that resilience is very short during. Now we're going to stealth out, and as you notice, the resilience again does not reply. They don't get that same buff, so just note with the tacticals, the resilience applied on Forest Cloak does not interact with tactical. Alright, so now I would like to go over your defensive abilities in just a little bit more detail. Uh, one thing to note is that as you get into more advanced fighting, it's very important to know exactly how your defensives work against different attacks and different enemies. And that becomes very specific, and it's something that you just have to learn and practice and get used to. There's not like a, hey, I just always know which one to use and when to use it, just because. You know, they all have cooldowns, but you can only use them so often. So. Let's start off with kind of our weakest, most basic, We're going and kind of work our way up from there. So Kinetic Ward, this is a very important thing for Shadow. You should always have Kinetic Ward up 100% of the time. Uh, 15 stacks increase your shield chance by 15% during the full duration, no matter how many stacks there are. Each time you successfully shield, it loses a charge and you get a 1% stack for shield absorption. So. And then whenever you refresh Kinetic Ward, all your stacks get reset and you no longer get that bonus absorption from Kinetic Ward. So important thing is it should always be up 100% of the time and to maximize its effectiveness, you want to refresh it just before it expires at that 20 seconds. Uh, you also get some other bonus that actually makes it 18% instead of 15% for the shield chance. Spinning Kick. If you're using Efficient Termination, 10% DR, extremely useful with how often it comes up. It's just nice in general, and you can also save it for periods uh, where you really need to mitigate a little bit of extra damage. This is all damage that it mitigates through the set bonus. Force Potency, mostly I use this as an offensive, but it also gives you 30% shield absorb. So this jacks you up to around 80, roughly, you know, 80% depending on where your stats are for shield absorb. And that means that you're just taking a lot less damage from every attack that you shield. I forget exactly how long the absorb bonus lasts, but it's fairly lengthy. Deflection. Deflection is your main uh, melee and ranged defensive. So melee and ranged defense is increased by 50% for 12 seconds. Basically, you have a really high chance of taking zero damage as a result. So, alien range defense increased by 50%. That's a huge number stacked with the amount that you already have. Uh, but again, the downside is this is, this is just melee and ranged. So, it does not work against force and tech attacks. Or, sorry, I shouldn't say that. It does not work against... Uh, is it force tech? Oh, whatever. Yeah, force and tech. So, it only works against melee ranged. But 
you know, it's pretty nice duration. It's, it's very strong against those. And it has an added bonus that the AOE area that you see underneath you, like the big glowing puddle that's under you, any enemy standing within there deal 15% less force and tech. So it's kind of like an AOE damage reduction, kind of like all on the Guardian. So any enemies that are being touched by that effect, they deal less force and tech damage. So if you've got fights where this is not any use because everything is force and tech or internal elemental, uh, then you know that's a very useful one. Here's the passive for it right here. All right, moving on to resilience. Now resilience is the bread and butter of the shadow tank and why they're so good. You can also get it applied on your force cloak as we've been talking about. So purge all hostile removable effects. So basically cleanses you of everything and increases your chance to resist force and tech attacks by 200% for five seconds does not break stealth. So this thing basically means you take zero force and tech damage while it's active. It's absolutely amazing considering that a large number of damage profiles from bosses happen to be force and tech attacks. So it's extremely useful on a lot more fights than melee and range. It has a very short cooldown for a good defensive being at one minute, but again, downside is it's not as long as, as some of the other defensives. You're not getting that 12 to 15 second kind of range. So battle readiness, this gives you an immediately 15% self heal, which is nice. Uh, it also increases your damage and it lasts 15 seconds, but it also gives you 25% damage reduction. So if we look here, oh, that's not the one. I have no idea where this one is, but there is a passive somewhere in here that you can read and it will tell you. Uh, Alright, so I found the passive here, Shadow Sight. Increase your... In addition, when you activate Battle Readiness, damage reduction is increased by 25%. So damage reduction, again, it mitigates all damage types. It's just flat. Whatever the final damage the boss is going to do to you, after applying your other mitigation techniques, you just shave off 25%. It's the exact same idea as our Efficient Termination set with the 10% DR. So, uh, you know, if you really need damage reduction to be a little higher, you could combine battle readiness with spinning kick and you'd actually have a 35% for that first five seconds. And then for the other 10 seconds, you'd be at 20. And as we've talked about, force cloak is a big defensive. You can get it to apply resilience for four seconds, as well as a lot of boss mechanics can be completely negated with this. Oh, I don't know why it's doing that. I know why it's doing that. That was on. All right, so now we're going to give you some examples. This is a recording of me in the Ravagers operation. Right now, I am the off tank, as we call it, because I'm going to be off of the main boss. I'm going to help pick up ads, deal with ads. Uh, so in here, in general, you know, I want to try and build threat on these ads from a distance using things like force pull are really good. Of course, I have my taunt available as well. When there's only one ad, it's not too big of a deal. And then later on in this fight, there ends up being multiple ads that I have to deal with. And it becomes much harder to keep, keep them because they all spawn in from everywhere. So you have to really be paying attention, it's target swapping quite easily. And it doesn't help that the other DPS are hitting them. So, and here's something that you don't want to be doing on this fight. You don't want to be standing in that ring if possible. So my poor tank, they're getting all these stacks. It look like a claw with a number. That's not good for them. They take a lot more damage. I'm just doing a shitty job in general here. So as you can see, I really should be at much higher than 17 stacks. All right. There's not too much to go over in this fight, um, but here's an example where I have all three enemies on me. So now I'd be using my AOE rotation. You can see a lot of whirling blow mixed in there. I did choose to go back to single target now because most of them are dead one left but I also wasn't paying enough attention to notice that you know there's these guys I should have grabbed them a lot earlier so if you're not real quick to react to these guys they will end up aggro on a healer or a DPS who decides to start shooting them right away because you build that threat right away it's not a lot of threat you can build at range so your taunt obviously will make them chase you for six seconds but it doesn't keep building threat your force pull all it does is build rate builds a high amount of threat for a single attack, 
And in the time it takes for them to walk to you, if your DPS are still shooting them, they will start walking towards a DPS. And now you can't necessarily group them up like this. So now I've got them nicely grouped up uh, so that I can use my AOE rotation on them. And it's much easier to hold their threat, although I'm still not able to hold the threat on all of them. You can see quite a few of them are still attacking a DPS. All right, this is the second boss here. This is a boss where we need to coordinate taunting with the other tank. Uh, this boss, Bulo, Quartermaster Bulo, he will choose to point his conal at randomly whoever has the top threat or the second highest threat. So both tanks will stand pointing his cleave away from the group and we'll take turns taunting him to make sure that uh, we always have the highest threat out of the two. So. I'll just get into this a little bit. I'm just explaining it here on the video. You can go find this on my Twitch channel if you're interested in watching more about the specifics on how to do this boss fight. So, the have we done our ready check yet? I don't think we have. The first taunts, and then I'll pick off. I'll taunt. We're just still talking about it. Let's go back a little bit. So we would have done. Hopefully, the other tank would have done a countdown there they knew when to go in. And you can see I didn't start with the opener so I haven't used my taunts yet. The other tank is going to be doing their taunting. They just use their AoE taunt. Now I'm going to taunt make sure that I'm staying high on that threat table as well. Um, if you want to do a cheeky thing with the ads, then yes. Yeah, so there's, there's me trying to do something but it didn't work. I did too. <laughs> so that big blue circle is very bad. I want to stand it. It does a lot of damage. You can see just a tunnel on me. Uh, right here, I've not used any defensives yet. The conal itself isn't really that hard hitting, so it's not as important. Uh, these mine carts, I'm just moving away so that the melee DPS aren't getting hit when they come to me because they splash to splash damage. All right, so here's another situation. Uh, it's not a good example. Okay, here's adds. I'm using my AOE rotation just to keep threat on as many adds as possible. And in this scenario, I'm not using my any of my defensives just because the damage output is actually fairly low. And our healers, well, they're usually not having a hard time keeping up with the damage output. But sometimes you get a little lazy when you're playing with good healers and you don't use them much. You can see here, I actually did use my deflection recently just to mitigate some of this damage with so many adds on me and all the blue circles everywhere dealing damage. And there I just walked through something that's really painful, and I should not have done that. <laughs> so I have like no health here, so this would be, so I'm just counting on the fact that most of the outgoing damage had stopped for this period of time, and I was just trusting that my healers would heal me up. But I was really worried, and I knew I was still taking damage, and uh, had to do something that my healers couldn't help heal me up in the next 10-15 seconds. I could have used my battle readiness for the 15% self-heal, 25% damage reduction, and if really needed, even use my med pack just to buy them some extra time. But again, there really wasn't much left dealing damage at that point. So I was able to uh, just ignore doing that. Now I'm standing in a bad position because if the boss were to look at me, except he's dead. But if he was still alive and he was to look at me, you know, his cleave would have potentially hit people in the group. But he's dead right now. So that's why. So. Now we're going to look at Torque. Torque is actually a very challenging fight, mostly because of camera angles. There is a tank swap that needs to be coordinated in here. Uh, you can technically kite it, but it's very hard to kite. So you can single tank this. It's just that there's a chance you will die when he puts a, a sick of you debuff on you. You have to kite it around and use it offensive when you don't have a speed boost to kite it. All right, so let's figure out. A little too far back. That's a tank swap. She asked if there was a cleave. So in this case, this boss doesn't have a cleave, so it really doesn't matter where anybody stands. Everyone can stand in front of him. He's going to put these red floor vents on the ground, so as long as you don't need to stand behind him, better for everyone to stack so they get put in the same spot. It's the four closest players to them. We gotta move out of the floor vents immediately. Uh, you can see my co-tank actually has a sick of UD buff, so I taunted there. I was a little late taunting. Should have taunted a bit sooner. 
And now I'm just going to face tank the boss. No real need to use a defensive. So I want to make sure that this boss is pointing in such a way that when he does his knockback before the tank swap, that I'm not going to be standing right next to him and get killed immediately. Move, 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 move. So we're moving for the floor vents. I'm getting a little close to the wall, so I'm going to reposition myself to get punted across the room. And then, there we go. I just got punted across the room. I have the sick of you debuff right there. And the other tank taunted off me. You'll notice I also did end up using deflection there. Uh, these, these tampering devices do put out a lot of damage. And I had the boss and I'd walked through some of the floor vents. So I was using it to mitigate damage. Using resilience right here. Not sure if it's actually useful or good. Floor vents on everybody. Move, move. I just used it there. Sometimes you just use defenses like an idiot, not realizing that <laughs> you're using one you shouldn't need to. So, yeah, really the main thing with this boss is uh, if, you're, you, if you're doing that tank swap, see there's that kick, make sure he doesn't hit you. And then something like 4 speed, you can actually kite him for quite a while if there is no tank to do a tank swap. And then of course you could use the defensive like deflection. I believe his damage is in melee range. So now, kind of the main interesting boss that I really want to showcase some of the unique advantages that the Shadow Tank has is Master and Blaster. So, Blaster himself, the big droid here, there's not too much that's very special for a Shadow Tank. Uh, his damage is tech damage, majority of it by far. He does a bit of a knockback. But otherwise, you know, he just does a lot of damage. There's nothing too special to him that we have to think about. There's a bit of a tank swap that we do in here. Uh, because what happens is if you get knocked back and you're too far away from him, he'll shoot a rocket at you that will knock you back and send you flying to your death. So you need the other tank to taunt if you get knocked away. And so usually to make it easier, groups will just tend to do the tank swap no matter what. Everybody push. So now Master's going to come down and there's quite a few things that we need to do with Master. So I've got a few issues here. I'm going to be stealthing out regularly and I need to keep threat for a very specific ability. So as soon as he comes down I start building threat. He does a fair amount of damage right out the get-go. But I have found that it's not worth using my defensive quite quite that early on. Uh, sometimes I'll use my battle readiness for the spinning fire wheel and stand in it. But I also have a way that I've designed my taunts to make sure I keep threat for this. So you'll notice here he had an overpowered beam and it got cancelled almost right away. So it will go back here. We'll slow down our playback speed to one half. We'll watch that in a little bit slower motion. So I'm making sure that I'm target to target by having that AoE taunt recently. He does his overcharged beam. And I just stealth out of combat. So the way that that works is I actually cancel his ability by stealthing out of combat. Now the thing is, you're a tank. You don't want somebody else getting shot by the boss. So I have to make sure I have this taunt available in this scenario. So as you can see, I just stealthed out right now. His beam just got interrupted. And you'll see I'm going to taunt immediately. And now he's back on me. And now I'm going to use Resilience, or maybe I'm not because I'm forgetful. But I did use Force Potency instead of... Oh, there we go. I did end up using Resilience. And you can see, resist, 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 resist. I'm taking no damage. So that's really awesome. When I did the Stealth Out and the Taunt, I get that 4 seconds of Resilience from that. And then I didn't need to use Battle Readiness there at all. I'm not sure why I used it again. That was a poor choice. But yeah, and then I use Resilience. And I resist that damage, and now he's going back to his regular damage. I'm going to start his fire wheel. So at this point I have to kite him. Thankfully a lot of my attacks are 10 meters range, so I can build a little bit of threat uh, if I really wanted to. But at this point I've got more than enough threat. I'm not too worried. As you can see I went back in the fire wheel just a bit, a little bit too early there. Partially to make sure I had enough threat. You're going to see once again we're going to cancel this by stealthing out. And you can see my buff here for the 4 seconds of resilience. Resist, resist. Now in this scenario I don't have uh, resilience back up off cooldown immediately. But the thing is he doesn't do as many attacks 
of this part because he now starts Reign of Pain. It was less damage that I'm taking compared to the first time I cancelled his beam. So there's a lot of advanced planning that goes into this fight in terms of how do I keep enough threat because there's a lot of times where I'm not shooting the boss or attacking him and I'm not building threat. I have to build the special pattern of when to use my taunts or some tanks what they'll do is they just won't run. When that spinning fire wheel comes up, they'll do something like use a batter readiness and a spinning kick to get 35% damage reduction, get that little pop of healing, and they will just hope their healers can heal them well enough through that damage. And that's definitely an option. Uh, you technically can use your deflection because it has that passive that gives you the additional 15% uh, damage reduction or the boss will do 15% less force and tech damage while he's inside of the area of your deflection. So you can use it for that to give yourself another little bit as well. In general, there's very little uh, melee ranged attacks. So that 50% bonus, you don't have to save it for anything. So you can definitely use it just to get that 15%, stay in the fire wheel, allow you to build more threat in the fire wheel. One of the important things too is Really knowing how much you can trust your healers and knowing when you don't need to panic if you see yourself at 30% health. So, you know, there's definitely times, as you can see right here, I popped a resilience. I really don't suggest that timing. Uh, it was kind of a mistake on my part. Again, stealth out uh, to prevent that. So you can see how that stealth becomes very important. There are other boss fights where you specifically will use stealth to make the boss target somebody else, but he will choose to cast the ability again after it's interrupted. You have to wait until he casts it on that player to taunt. A good example would be Explosive Conflict when you're dealing with the tanks. You want to make sure that uh, the tanks storm call in Firebrand. If you're on Firebrand and he casts Incinerate Armor, you stealth out before the channel finishes. You will then look at somebody else, cast it on them, and then you taunt back to make sure you don't get it. So hopefully this gives you a brief overview of how, you know, you, you have to be able to learn the specifics of each fight when it comes to knowing which defensives are really good to use when. And the harder the content becomes, the more mandatory it becomes that you're actually able to figure out which defensives to use when. When the content's easier, it's not as big of a deal. But the main thing is, you know, you have to be thinking about how do I prevent the damage before I take the damage? Rather than thinking, oh shit, I have no health, use the defensive so my healers can catch up. Well, that's, that's bad. You know, if you can prevent 80% of the damage instead of uh, making your healers heal it while you prevent 20% of the damage, you know, the math is pretty much self explanatory. So, this is a scenario where our strategy here is just let me die, the tank who's getting all the stacks, die, and then just use a combat res. It's much easier than, than the alternative, because you take more damage from both bosses the more stacks you have. And again, this was a really good example of showing the threat, how extremely specific you have to be to generate enough threat. Because one of the big problems that I had happen a lot was I would go to stealth out of combat for that beam, except the boss had switched targets because somebody else had more threat than me, because one, I'm kiting during the fire wheel, so you can see here how I'm waiting and I'm using my AoE taunt so that by the time before that six second wears off, he's still looking at me. So that's very critical there. Is that I was timing that AoE taunt, making sure I had that. Uh, and as I was saying, the other option is to stand in the fire wheel, pop one of the defensives that's not resilience and not force cloak, <laughs> uh, and just keep building threat the normal way. All right, so I'm going to skip over the part about using star parts. If you want to learn more about the value of star parts as a tank, how to use it to figure out different damage profiles on the bosses, to help you know when to use your defensives, etc., etc., check out my Guardian Tank video for that. If you look in the description, there's a timestamp. It'll take you directly to that spot. But you don't need to watch the whole video. So now we're going to move on to just kind of a summary. Again, this is in the other video, but I'm going to put in this one, is just the general tanking philosophy and the role of the tank. So I think I'll probably do a slightly better job in the other video if you feel like this description is lacking, because I'm going to blow through it a bit faster. 
So there's three, there's just a few main roles of the tank. So the first main role of a tank is holding threat on what you're responsible for. So you're not a good tank if you don't hold threat. End of story. And you need to practice and get better until you are a good tank in terms of holding threat. Uh, it's a little bit challenging this in this game to hold threat. You know, they definitely made it so that very, very good DPS can rip threat off the tank who's not playing really well. So, but I've also seen people who just absolutely no idea how to hold threat as a tank. They're much more novice, not as good at it. So, you know, some people just need to vastly improve their skills as a tank. And then once you get quite comfortable and quite good at tanking, you'll find that unless you're constantly playing with very high, high level players, you can get pretty lazy as a tank and threat becomes very easy to keep. Like if I hop into a flashpoint or random groups, I usually can be very lazy as a tank and still hold threat because knowing how to use when and how to use my taunts, along with just using the proper rotation, it's very hard for people to rip threat off me other than right at the beginning of a fight. So you have to also know that sometimes it's not your responsibility to tank everything. So obviously the more stuff that can shoot you instead of a DPS or a healer, the better. But there are times where you only are responsible for tanking certain enemies and you're not responsible for everything on the map. Now this might be because you have another tank who's picking up the other enemies, or it might simply just be a scenario where you don't pick up the adds or the smaller enemies and you're only tanking you know the biggest couple heaviest hitty and the other ones can freely go and hit whoever and it's not a big deal so like when you're doing let's say a boss that suddenly spawns in a bunch of adds at different corners of the room it's impossible for you to suddenly tank all of those it's not required you know like there's just no way to physically do it so you just have to know when it's your responsibility when it's not uh, reducing your damage taken as much as possible. So, yeah, you want to take as little damage as possible to make it easier for your healers. And by making it easier on your healers, you also make it easier on your DPS because now the healers have spare capacity to cover for all the mistakes that your DPS are going to eventually make during a fight. So you have to learn all the ways your class mitigates damage and the types of incoming damage to know what's the best way to minimize it. Uh, obviously gearing is a part of it too, but there's not a lot you can do there. Uh, for each class you have to learn what abilities you have that you can put in your rotation to maximize your damage reduction. With Shadow, getting that glowing cascading debris for the four stacks, uh, you know, or starting stealth before combat. Those are examples of how we build a rotation to mitigate as much damage as possible. Same thing with knowing when to use Kinetic Ward and Spinning Kick. Now on some other classes, it's even more important because they have more abilities that help prevent the outgoing damage or incoming. So the other thing too, when it comes to reducing your damage, take as much as possible, is you have to know when it's actually something that you should be mitigating or something that you should allow your healers just to, to just heal you through. Because you do have limited resources of defensives and you have to figure out which ones are priorities. So that can be a mistake players make is, you know, using defensives uh, in a period where they're really not taking that much damage and it's better to just let your healers heal it. And then you've got your defensive up for a period where you're taking way more damage. Moving out of avoidable damage. This sounds pretty self-explanatory, but in practice it can be a bit hard to keep track of everything. But, you know, you have to know when to move, when to step out of something so you're not taking damage from it. And then minimizing the damage your raid takes. So this is a very important part. Generally, most fights, the tank stands in front of the boss and everyone else stands behind because the boss generally has attacks that hit things in front of it. So knowing how to position the boss, where to point him, where to take him in the room, etc. That's a very important part of knowing how to minimize how much damage he's dealing to the rest of your raid team while allowing them to put out full damage on him. All right. Third role is knowing how to position the enemies and the boss, which ties into what we were just talking about on how to minimize damage. There's certain other aspects of positioning the boss that are important, such as preventing yourself from getting knocked to your death, uh, preventing the boss from hitting other players we talked about. So, you know, positioning enemies so that the DPS can maximize their damage when there's multiple enemies. So just stuff like that, you know, or maybe you can't allow enemies to stand in a certain area of the map where they get buffed, you know, or keep them spread out. And then 
This is kind of not really an extra point, it ties into a bit of everything, but making it easier for your group to kill the enemies. So the more skilled and the more advanced you get as a tank, the better you should be at allowing people to maximize their DPS, whether that's because you're preventing enemies from uh, attacking them and stunning them and preventing them from doing stuff, or simply that you're just able to group them up so they can start using their area of effect damage more effectively. All right, so let's just do a bit of a summary conclusion here for everything we've talked about. So we talked about your stats and your gearing. One thing I want to impress on people is it's very easy to have a nice formula that doesn't take long to learn about what's the best gear, what's the best stats, and build towards that. It doesn't take a lot of skill. It just, you know, look at somebody's already given you get this piece, this piece, this piece, and then you just grind and grind and grind until you find them. Now, when you look at somebody who's got optimal stats, the best gear for tanking, if you're within 10% of that, you're, you're almost done. You know, like you don't need to be perfect everything. If you've got 47% shield absorb as a shadow and 48% shield chance, and you've got 5,500 defense rating, that's fine. You can still tank. You're not going to go necessarily do some of the hardest content in the game, um, but you've got enough stats. It's not a big issue if you're a few percentage points short of the targets, so really don't stress about that. You know, it's just such a small fraction of being a good tank. You know, and the optimization between level 70 and level 75 stuff, as you can see, I take a very easy, very lazy approach, and I just have a few extra lethal B mods Let's sit in my inventory and I just swap out some mods and I call her done. I don't even bother with the whole enhancement thing. And it's, you know, at the end of the day, if you're playing with a good team and you're skilled, that starts becoming very viable. Now, if you are the person who wants to have perfect gear, by all means, I'm not telling you don't do it. Just remember that gear is not the most important part of being a tank. It is, you know, it's important that you meet a certain level of gearing, but past that, it's not very important at all. We talked about uh, utilities. So I gave you an example of a really good kind of custom, uh, general use, I should say, utility layout. I, again, I suggest taking screenshots and saving layout your different utility layouts and naming them. So sometimes you might have ones for a specific boss fight or you might say, hey, it's for this type of stuff. So maybe you want one that's designed for kiting or one that's designed for when you get stunned or one that's designed for, um, you know, self heals or, you know, you just pick the things that's different about it compared to the other ones. And then that's how you can kind of create these general topics. Uh, sometimes just having one's name for a boss is really nice too. The options that you have, I went over which utilities can be swapped around versus which ones are mandatory. We did skip some of the ones that I'm like, these are pretty much only ever PvP, so I didn't go into detail. Because why would I? I'm not a PvPer. <laughs> I went over the user interface and layout. Again, you don't have to do it the way I do, and I don't suggest that you automatically just copy me. Really look around and figure out what works well for you, and experiment with it and change it. Like, it's definitely worth setting up a user layout, taking the time to do it, and then as you play, tweak little things and move little things as you find, oh, that button's hard for me to find, or I don't like where I've placed it. And putting that red text in the middle of the screen somewhere at the largest scale, that's a thing that really helped me a lot. And then we went into talking about our opener, threat generation, and then we talked about our rotation and everything. So, you know, I gave you two different examples of a really good opener depending on if you take the utility or not, and you want to know those openers quite well, and you want to know where you need to taunt within those openers. As I said, nobody's going to rip off you as a tank in the first three G CDs unless they're another tank. Uh, shadow tanks quite often will lose threat to a guardian tank at the very beginning of a fight before your first taunt goes out. Not always, uh, but it's about knowing which bosses you have to have it look at you. The so master and blaster, when you first pull blaster, he cannot look at anybody else. You will probably kill them if he looks at anybody else during the opener. So in that one, you have to be very tight with your opener and your taunts to make sure nobody pulls off of you. But other fights, you can be a bit lazier. You can extend them out. The reason why there's an advantage to delaying your taunts 
is that bonus threat generation that they make piles up. So the more threat that's been built on the boss when you taunt, the better your bonus is. So that's the reason why sometimes people will hold on and wait longer to taunt rather than taunting, you know, right after that third GCD of combat. Then you want to make sure again that you know about the overlapping. Uh, make sure that if you need to keep that boss on you, the timing for your second AoE taunt so that he doesn't look away. And that buys you a lot of time and generally at that point you will end up having the highest threat over everybody else. There's still a risk though if you don't use any more taunts for the rest of the fight. There's definitely a risk that somebody who's not guarded or even sometimes a person who is guarded can pull off of you. Especially as a shadow tank. I personally find that shadow tanks have the lowest threat generation out of the three tanking classes uh, when you play it well. We talked about the single target and the AoE target priority systems. So that's also important to note that there is uh, those two distinctions, although it's not really complicated in either sense of the form, because we're not looking to maximize our damage the way that a DPS is. We're looking at doing all of our tanking abilities and all of our tanking jobs, which one of them being threat generation, comes from having good DPS. But you know, we've got a lot more important things than hitting a top damaging parse for our spectrum class. Talked a little bit about defensives, what each defensive does, the different ones that we have available to us, and it's something that you, there's no shortcut to learning how to use them in each fight. It just takes practice, it just takes time, it takes a bit of research. You know, the, the only shortcut that there is, is going and learning from other people, the timing, so that you don't have to figure out that, but you're still gonna have to practice it. Just because you read once, oh, I use this here and I use this there, it's not that easy in an actual fight. You know, you'll get confused, you'll forget things. So with practice, it'll start becoming more natural, more muscle memory. We gave you some examples of tanking in a recording I had from the Ravagers operation. I wouldn't say it's an amazing example of my tanking, but it gave you some thoughts, you know, on we had to coordinate some tank swaps in there. I didn't actually talk about who was guarding, but you want to make sure that you're always guarding, you know, the person who's most likely to rip threat is other than a very few cases. So one thing that's important to note is you might sometimes hear people say that you want to guard healers. That's usually bullshit. Is the odd time you want to guard healers? Yes, but most of the time, no. So a tank generates threat 2.5 times the amount of damage they deal when it comes to attacks or certain abilities generate a fixed amount of threat. Healers, the amount of heals that they put out, and I forget if it's effective heals or raw heals, but the amount of heals they put out, they generate 0.5 threat per heal, roughly, and that's spread out across all enemies in the room. So if you have multiple enemies in the room, it does not take much threat for you to stay way ahead of a healer in terms of threat because it's getting divided across so many enemies in the room. But if there's only a single enemy in the room, there actually are times where the healers can rip threat off of a tank. The other issue comes into play is some enemies are considered in the room, but they can't be targeted and they can't be attacked. But yet, for whatever reason, the healers are still generating threat on them well, they do healing, so when that enemy finally comes into the room, it looks at the healer first and says, fuck you, tank, I didn't know you had threat. But this, you know, this healer's got like 5,000 or 50,000 already, you know, whatever it is. So that, that's something to keep in mind. It's a bit of a side tangent for a conclusion, but yeah. So generally, though, you don't guard healers because all it will do is give them a 5% damage mitigation or something like that. There's a few very specific examples where it's worth guarding them because they will have generated threat uh, at very high levels. Uh, or you just want to give them that damage reduction. But most of the time you need to guard your highest chance of ripping threat off you damage dealing player so that they're not ripping threat off of you. We also showed you a really good example with Master and Blaster on how the full toolkit of a shadow tank be so impressive with uh, stealth out of combat being huge that beam that I kept interrupting it's it puts stacks on you that don't go away and when you're at like 10 stacks 
each tick is like, I don't know, 20% of your health or something like that. And you get like two ticks a second. Like it's just insane amounts of damage. So we're mitigating this and making it way easier for everybody on the team compared to other methods if you didn't have uh, shadow tanks stealthing out for that attack. We also showed you how, you know, some of the differences between like deflection and resilience, how resilience can be so good, etc. We skipped the start parse thing, as I said, go to the other video for that. And then we went over the general tanking philosophy really quickly. And now we're here. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope this has taught you some things. And if you have more questions, go look up my other guides or just post in the comments and I will try and get back to you.